Amen. Uh, turn this morning, please, to Genesis chapter number 11. <clears throat> Genesis chapter number 11. And as we're physically able, let's go ahead and stand, please. And we're going to read together the, verse, the first nine verses. We're going to start there. <clears throat> There'll be a lot of page turning this morning. Genesis chapter 11, beginning in verse number 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to... Let us make brick and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon all the face of the earth. And let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us as believing people to not only affirm the authority of the scriptures, but to live out that authority. That we would be the light and the salt that you have called us to be. I pray that you would establish our hearts and strengthen them and encourage us and instruct us from your word this day. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. Well, welcome on this Labor Day, <clears throat> one of the last holiday weekends of the year, the traditional closing of summer. <clears throat> uh, we're old school, and so we do not resume our academy until after Labor Day. So this really is the end of summer, uh, <clears throat> at least uh, in my mind, that's how I count it. For those of you who are normally here on Sundays, you know that we are working our way through the Gospel of Mark on Sunday mornings. Um, but I want to depart from that a little bit this morning and confession to, to focus both messages this morning, or this morning and this evening, both messages today uh, <clears throat> are in my mind, I'm going to mention COVID a number of times. Uh, <clears throat> But they're kind of indirectly, at least in my mind, related to COVID. Uh, <clears throat> I interpret the reaction to this quasi-pandemic as part of the evidence of the power of the world and the power that the world has to influence the way we collectively think and act. And so for that reason, COVID has a prominent place in the message this morning. 
The Labor Day weekend, Labor Day is, of course, the American holiday dedicated to the celebration of the American laborer, that group of people that were once known as the working class. Um, and in that spirit, let me thank those of you who labor for the Lord for the work that you do. It is uh, not unappreciated by me. I know that I am often remiss to express my gratitude to you for all that you do and all the labor that you put into the ministry, both seen and not seen, uh, both out in front of people and behind the scenes. Uh, even more importantly, your labor is not forgotten by the Lord, and the Lord assures you that it would be an act of unrighteousness on his part if he were to forget it. God is not unrighteous, the writer of Hebrews says, not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. So all that you have done for him, all that you do for him is remembered by him, and this is one of the demonstrations of his righteousness. So uh, again, thank you for all that you do uh, for the ministry here at Westwood Heights and uh, <clears throat> for your labor for the Lord. Uh, <clears throat> we're living in unusual times. Um, <clears throat> How unusual they are, I think, yet is yet to be seen, and what the ultimate consequences of this are, are yet to be seen. But let us not forget something, folks. Let us who believe remember something, that one of the assurances that God gives us is that people who have made a conscious and willful decision to reject God and all that he stands for are going to be subjected to what the Bible calls a reprobate mind. Uh, <clears throat> let me just read to you two verses from Romans chapter 1. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, that's where we are as a nation, not necessarily as a world, but as a nation, that's where we are. Uh, <clears throat> You can, you can find the image of the man, no doubt, with a Google search. He's wearing a t-shirt that says, if Jesus comes back to earth, we will kill him again. That is his position. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. A reprobate mind is a mind that is incapable of making sound judgments. And therefore, they do those things which are not convenient. They are then, Romans, 8, 20, Romans 1, 29, filled, filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers. What it looks like in practice is what Isaiah talked about. They call evil good, and they call good evil. These are the people. This is a sampling of the mentality that is absolutely driving the world in which we live. People who do not know right from wrong who have lost the ability to see clearly what should be obvious. They are the people who are making decisions on our behalf, who are telling us what to do and why we should do it. Now, we live in that world, and that's part of the text that we will get to this morning. We live in that world. We are called to live in that world, but we are not of that world. And we have to factor that in to all that we do. So I take us back this morning to Genesis chapter 11. Of course, we know that God created one man, Adam, and one woman, Eve. A married couple gave to them paradise, prohibited them from eating the forbidden fruit, they immediately made a beeline for it, and the world collapsed into sin. And by this one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed to all of us because all sinned. 
And Romans 5.12 actually is a reference to what we call the doctrine of original sin. We all sinned in Adam. Uh, our, our, death, our death comes because of Adam's sin before we ever get to any of the sins that we commit in our own right. From that moment, the world began to develop, and it developed along two lines, the line of Adam and believing people and the line of unbelievers, and that's where we find ourselves in Genesis chapter 11. Because of God's judgment upon human hubris, confusion is the norm of the world. Because of God's judgment upon human hubris, confusion is the norm of the world. In Genesis chapter 10 and verse number 5, and if you have Genesis 11, it's just going to be a page or maybe even on the same, the same page. Genesis chapter 10 and verse number 5, it begins what we call the table of nations. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. We're about to get an explanation of why there are these nations and these tongues. That's what's coming in Genesis 11. The word isle simply refers to coasts, borders, boundaries. This is the way the world is. There's, there are different nations, there are borders, there are boundaries. If you jump down to chapter 10 and verse number 8, you have this man, Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Echad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. So we have introduced to us this man, Nimrod. He is a mighty hunter. Who cares? What if you don't like hunting? But the point, folks, is that Nimrod was a provider, a mighty hunter. He fed the people. He provided for a kingdom. And there's nothing, by the way, necessarily wrong with that, except for the way in which Nimrod did that. He did that before the Lord. And the idea of before the Lord is in God's face. He's doing this in God's face. He has taken it to himself to be competition with God, head to head. That's the idea. That's the condemnation of Nimrod, folks. It wasn't that he was a really good shot. It wasn't that he could really stalk prey in a way that nobody else could. It wasn't that he knew where the fish were. It wasn't that. Is that Nimrod took to himself the qualities and the attributes of God and sought to replace God with himself and to, develop, to build for himself a kingdom. How did all that come about? Well, that's where Genesis chapter 11 begins to give us the story of how that came about. These men, too, verses 1 through 4, wanted to go head to head with God. Let's build a tower. Let's, let's all stay together. <clears throat> let's build ourselves a nation. Let's build a tower that reaches heaven and let's make for ourselves a name. Let's do those things that are ours to do. Let's, let's compete with God. And so in verse number 5 and verse number 6, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower. Now let's understand, folks, because I would suggest to you, and if you're willing to write yourself a note in your Bible, I would suggest, folks, that verse number 5 be noted in some way with this. This is funny. This is funny. Because it is funny. It's a divine sense of humor. Get the picture here. The very best minds that men can come up with and the very best ideas that they can come up with and the very best accomplishments that they can make. They have built them and they have ascended them into heavens. And God is so far above them that he has to come down to look. 
If you took all of the achievements of all of the human beings that have ever lived, and folks, God has allowed some people who have literally turned the world upside down in industry and in banking and in medicine and in technology. If you took all of those men and all of their billions and all of their accomplishments and you towered them up to heaven, God is so far above that he would still have to come down to see what was going on. There's a little bit of humor here. The best that we can do is still far below where God is. God comes down. God looks around. God sees what is up and he sees what is the potential. And folks, it is never a good thing. Right? In the mind of men, in the mind of men, it is a good thing for everybody to think the same thing, everybody to be under the same rules, everybody to live under the same system. It is a good thing. I would point out to you from Genesis 11, God does not think that it is a good thing. God does not believe that this is a good idea. And we have evidence of that from the way that God responds. And so in verse number 6, down through verse number 9, God judges them. Verse number 7, go to, let us go down, and there confound their language. And there confound their language. Now, I don't want to get into all this, but if you, if you begin to trace down the word, they are attempting to build a gateway to the God, to the heavens. And with only minor variation, you end up with Babel, confusion. The, the gateway to the heavens became to them confusion when God got done with them. In their mind, they are building an access point to the very throne of God. And in God's mind, they have no idea what's going on. They have been smitten with confusion. Babel then, <clears throat> verse number nine, Babel then becomes the biblical center of opposition to God. This system, this city, becomes the center of divine opposition. There are modern-day ruins to the ancient city of Babel. They lie about 60 miles south of Baghdad. Babel is believed to have been the first city in human history to exceed 200,000 inhabitants. It was a great and tremendous city. But it is the epicenter of opposition to God. Usually throughout the Bible, it is no longer called Babel, but Babylon. Let me ask you if you would to turn to Revelation chapter 14. We'll come back to Genesis in a few minutes. But let me just read, or just have you to read. What God has to say, Genesis chapter 11, however many years ago that was, 5,000, 6,000. Revelation 14, verse number 8. <clears throat> there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of of her fornication. Or Revelation chapter 16 and verse number 19. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island, coast, fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Revelation 17, 1, And there came one of the angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore, 
that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abomination and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, and when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. I wondered with great admiration. Jump down to verse number 15. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples, and multitudes, and nations, and tongues. Verse number 18, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Revelation 18, 2. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities." This is the end of Babylon, folks, and whatever your eschatological view, we, of course, are dispensationalists, and we believe that these are literal events that are yet to happen prior to the coming of Jesus Christ the second time in the establishment of the Millennial Kingdom. These are harsh and unsettling words in any scheme of biblical prophecy. There is a system... It is an economic system. It is driven by lust. It is given to fornication. It is called the mother of whores. This is what we have described in its embryonic form in Genesis chapter 11. It is the world system energized by Satan that is opposed to God. And it is no mystery, folks. We, we, we as, as believers often ask, why is it that every other religion can be tolerated but ours? We should not ask that question. We should know the answer to that question. The Bible is very clear about that. That Babylon was drunk with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus Christ. And we are her targets. And we ignore that to our very own peril. So this is the world that we inhabit, a world energized by Satan. A world that is built upon lies, that is increasingly unable to distinguish fact from fiction, truth from fantasy. And these are the people. This is, this is not conspiracy, folks. This is biblical route. These, these are, for the most part, the people who are telling us what is happening to the world and not only informing us of it, but interpreting for it, us for it. And it is a very sad thing if we allow that interpretation of the world to dominate our lives. Back to Genesis chapter 11, please. Because of man's hubris, because of his unrestrained pride to think that he could compete with God, God has judged mankind with confusion. Secondly, because of God's mercy, 
Some are delivered out of that confusion and out of that judgment. Genesis chapter 11 and verse number 10. These are the generations of Shem. Now, we read our Bibles by chapter and verse divisions, and those are very helpful, and I would never be critical of them. But Genesis, like the rest of the Bible, wasn't written in chapter and verse divisions. And so the authors used a variety of means to express to us when they changed directions. And Genesis's um, major indicator that a new topic is at hand is this little expression. These are the generations, or this is the generation. This is how the book is told to us. This is how it is divided. These are the generations of Shem. We've been reading about the Gentiles. Now we're reading about Shem, or as we would refer to him, the Semitic people. And Shem is significant because he is going to connect us to Abraham, and he is Abraham, of course, is the legitimate inheritor of the promise of deliverance in Genesis 3.15. If you jump down to chapter or verse number 27 of chapter 11, you have another change in subject. Now, these are the generations of Terah. And what will happen here is that this is the section that will introduce us to Abraham and will take the story of Abraham's life all the way through chapter 25. <clears throat> Note what it says, verse number 27. Now, these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. So Terah had three boys, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran had a boy. His name is Lot. Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. So Haran, one of the three sons, died while dad was still alive. Verse number 29 then, Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. Now, our presumption is, by the way, that these, because they are, I just don't know any other way to put it without lengthy explanations, these are quasi-incestuous marriages. They're almost certainly half-sibling marriages. Abraham was married to his half-sister. He gets into that later on in the book of Genesis. Verse number 31, Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they come unto Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So Haran died, died while dad was still alive. Abram and, Terah get, Abram and Neroy, the remaining two sons, get married. Abram's wife is unable to have children. Dad takes Abram his son, Lot his nephew, Sarai his daughter-in-law, and they leave. They are headed for the land of Canaan. If you look at a map, the shortest route from Ur of the Chaldees to Canaan is due west, but you have to cross a desert. So the traveled route was northwest along the Euphrates, up past the then city of Babylon, into what was known as Upper Mesopotamia. And it is there that they stopped. And according to verse number 29, this land where they are in, in Haran is probably where the family residence for Haran was. The question is, why did they leave? Right, we're being told a story. 
And the story he has as its background is this, that all of the world is united in its opposition to God and is going to compete with him. God judges that world and smites it with confusion. And aren't languages a confusing thing? They really are, folks, an amazing thing. Any child can learn any language. If you're growing up speaking a language, you're going to learn to speak that language. But unless you are a very rare adult, you will struggle and labor to learn a different language, and it will take much time and effort to master it completely. This is the work of the Lord. God didn't just find it appealing to the ears that there would be a variety of ways to say hello. This is part of the confusion of the dissecting of the world to keep it from unifying against him. That is his judgment. In his mercy, he delivers some from that judgment. And we're being told about some of those people who are being delivered. Why did they leave? Right, The physical separation, folks, is important in understanding the story. The judgment comes upon a physical place. People are now scattered. Where does Abraham live? Very close to Babylon. Where is he going? Why did they leave? So by judgment there is confusion. By mercy there is deliverance. By grace, there is understanding that the deliverance comes through the word of the Lord. Now, the chronology in the chapter, folks, in chapter 10 of verse number 11, is not a strict chronology, and that tends to make it a little challenging for us because our minds tend to follow things strictly chronologically. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, through the years. But God doesn't tell the stories that way. In fact, usually doesn't tell his stories in that kind of chronological event. We talk about Tira, I think, out of respect for the family traditions. It was a patriarchal world. It was dominated by the oldest male. We talked about Tira while Tira lives. When Tira dies, we talk about the next most dominant male, that's Abraham. So we don't get a, this is the story, the generation of Abraham, we get this is the generation of Terah. In chapter 12 then, verses 1 through 5, you have <clears throat> this. And, and what I, here's, what, here's my suggestion. And let's just go ahead and read Genesis 12, 1 through 5. Now the Lord had said, right? You notice that there, the Lord had said. Because what you're reading in Genesis 12 actually occurred before what you're reading in Genesis 11. The Lord had said to Abraham, get thee out of thy country. And so Terah leaves, and Sarah leaves, and Lot leaves. Why? Because the Lord had said to Abram. The Lord had said to Abram, get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Those two verses are known as the Abrahamic covenant. They contain four components. We won't unpack that today. But there is the great Abrahamic covenant. What happened? Verse number four, so Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. Now, if you want to know what Abram's life was like just prior to that, Joshua 24.2 explains. Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. Abram was a pagan. 
You can read about Mesopotamian religion. It's all over the place. You can find YouTube videos about Mesopotamia and Ur of the Chaldees and Sumerian life and Sumerian religion. That was Abram. He was up to his ears in pagan idolatry. And then God showed up. Without explanation, we don't know why. Why did he pick Abram? Your guess is as good as mine. But the Lord showed up and said to Abram, Get out of thy country. Get out of thy, leave the land of your kindred. I will show you where to go. And Abram departed according to the word of the Lord. This departure is one of the most graphic evidences of their faith. This physical departure. And again, folks, I don't want to try and develop this too deeply. But we all know the story of what Jesus told the rich young ruler. Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, then sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And he went away sorrowful, for he had many possessions. But I would point out to you folks that Abraham did exactly, exactly, what Jesus simply said the rich young ruler had to do. Abram did it. He left his home. He left his countrymen. He left his nativity. He left his language. He left it all. And in fact, Hebrews 11.8 says of him, By faith when he was called out to go out into a place which he should after receive for inheritance, obeyed. And he went out. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles, tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of him, with the same promise, not knowing whither he went. Abraham responded to the word of the Lord in faith. And by the way, folks, if you would like to know all of the Bible that Abram had, here it is. Here's all the Bible that Abram had at that time that we know of. It's Genesis 12.1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto the land that I will show thee. That's it. There is the totality as far as we know of his scriptures. He could write his entire Bible on a three-by-five card and tuck it in his shirt pocket. Of course, he had neither of those, but he could have if he did. And he had the promise and here's the point that I'm making, folks. For, for we who believe, for us who are believers, the word of the Lord is our light in a confusing world. It is our light in a confusing world. Peter explains to us that we have a more sure word of prophecy. What you hold in your hands this morning completed, inspired, translated into your very own language, which for most of us is English, is, according to the New Testament, more reliable even than what Abraham had. A more certain word of prophecy. And therefore, we do well that we take heed to it as a light that shineth in a dark place. This is a Bible, folks, that is intended to be our light. To be our light. How do we interpret? <clears throat> right? I have information being presented to me at a rapid, non-stop rate. It is inescapable, television, radio, on my phone, on my desktop, on my tablet. A constant barrage of information about all kinds of things. About economics, about religion, about world events, about morality, about brutality, about justice, about injustice, about race relations. How do I interpret all of that information? I have light. 
My options, folks, are simply to interpret it in the light of the Word of God or to plunder around in the darkness like everybody else. And in the darkness, every man's opinion is as good as any other man's, and all the power belongs to the people who have the money and the ability to wield their way. This is not just about the most recent attempt of the world to move us one way or another, no matter how well-intentioned they are, no matter how right they might be about certain things, although it is not possible that they were right in March and right in September. But the word of the Lord endures forever. It is our master. It is to be obeyed. Part of that obedience, folks, is legitimate submission to civil authority. So this is not a revolutionary message. But we are ultimately to be obedient to the Bible. And that obedience, if we are genuinely living in a place that in some ways could be called Babylon, is going to come with a price. And we are supposed to be prepared to pay it. Now we have enjoyed for many years, and hopefully we will continue to enjoy for many years, much more shelter for the practice of our religion than many people have. But that should not make us soft about our commitment to obedience to the Bible. Let me ask you, if you would please, to turn almost to the end of the Old Testament to the little book of Amos. Let me just try and tie all this together, folks. There are two systems. There are two systems by the direction of the Lord. He came to earth and smote the existing system with confusion. And Babylon, the system of confusion, has existed and at times appeared triumphant throughout the history of the world. There is no neutrality about this. There is no such genuine thing as secularism, as a separate entity from religion. God just does not believe that. He will not accept that that there can be a scientific world that just doesn't do him. Just doesn't do him. And therefore, since it doesn't do him, he will not be concerned with it. That's my point. We can say, we don't want anything to do with God. But God never says, well, but I don't want anything to do with you. He always responds to people. In his mercy, God delivers some people from judgment, and he ju does that through the vehicle of his word. And I, by word, I mean his spoken word, and then ultimately, right, the living word. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he does that in his mercy and in his grace by orienting us in belief to his word, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. The very faith that we have is his gift to us. And therefore, folks, every response that we have, all of our conduct, should be governed to him. COVID is the center stage at the moment. Again, I'm not saying it's not real. We have people here in the assembly who have been diagnosed with COVID. We have people who have been convinced that they have it but have not been tested. The question is not whether it is a real thing. The question is, what is the right response? What do we do about it? And when COVID is passed, 
there will be something else in which we will have to decide. What is my obligation as a believer in light of this event? How do I respond in light of this crisis? And most of those crises, folks, are not global in perspective. They're individual in perspective. Most of the crises that we have to live out our Christianity in come to us, not to everybody around us. But let me just give to you this little bit of perspective. Amos chapter 9. I saw the Lord standing, verse number 1, I saw the Lord standing upon the altar, and he said, Smite the lintel of the door that the post may shake. Whack the frame and let the doors tremble. Cut them in the head, all of them, and I will slay the last of them with the sword. He that fleeth of them shall not flee away, and he that escapeth of them shall not be delivered. Though they dig into hell, and and the idea, the Old Testament idea of hell much of the time is the grave. So they dig into the dirt, thence shall mine hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. And though they hide themselves in the top of Carmel, I will search and take them out thence. And though they be hid from my sight in the bottom of the sea, thence will I command the serpent, and he shall bite them. And though they go into captivity before their enemies, thence will I command the sword, and it shall slay them. And I will set mine eyes upon them for evil and not for good. And the Lord God of hosts is he that toucheth the land, and it shall melt. And all that dwell therein shall mourn, and it shall rise up wholly like a flood, and shall be drowned as by the flood of Egypt. It is he that buildeth his stories in the heaven, and hath founded his troop in the earth. He that calleth for the waters of the sea and poureth them out upon the face of the earth, the Lord, is his name. Now this is a specific prophecy about the nation of Israel and its attempts to escape God. But but here's the the question, where are we going to go? Where are we going to go? And let us be clear, folks, the Bible is giving us a perspective on this. We're not trying to get away from COVID. We're trying to get away from Jehovah. Where will we go to hide? A hole? He can find us there. Run away? He can chase us down. Up? He can go up. Into hiding? He can go into hiding. Into prison? He can go into the prison. The good news, the good news Because again, specific prophecy for Israel, verse number 14 of of Amos 9, I will bring again the captivity of my people. He can bring us into judgment. He can bring us into deliverance. And they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them, and I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. So we are supposed to be, folks, ultimately, at the end of the day, people of the book, which again includes a right and respectful obedience to civil authorities. But it is not permission to lose our minds, and it is not permission for God's people to abandon their God because someone has cried germ. Let's pray together this morning. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and thank you that our common bond this morning is that you have given us the gift of faith and we believe you. Lord, you know our fears and our insecurities and our doubts. You know the sinfulness of our flesh, but you also know the power of your might. And I pray that you would strengthen our faith and that In all things, at all times, our orientation would be we would make a beeline to the Bible. That we would seek there your face and your understanding and your word and your will. Grant us this gift, please. I pray for us in Jesus' name. Amen.